<laughs> okay, title of my sermon this morning is Why I'm a Christian. Why I'm a Christian. You've, if you've ever gone soul winning with me or uh, you know, if you've chatted with me about this topic before, you might have heard some form of this sermon uh, before. But I thought I would uh, preach it as a sermon just so everyone, not everyone who's had a chance to go soul winning with me and sort of seen my explanation on why I take the belief that I do uh, just so you guys understand and also give, give you some ammunition as well uh, to defend your faith. <clears throat> so I'll come back to John 6 because that's where we're going to end. But today I'm talking about the reasons or the reason why I'm a Christian. Now different people <coughs> come to a point of believing on Jesus Christ for different reasons, don't they? Uh, one might be they grew up in the religion. You know, some one reason why people are Christian. They just grew up. That's just the, the family that they were in. They have a Christian background. They grew up and, they, and then they eventually believed on Christ. That's one reason why they're a believer on Jesus Christ. Some people did it for someone else. You know, maybe a wife gets saved just because she wanted to be the same religion as a husband. But then that's the, that's the reason why she ended up getting saved. Right? That's the reason why she came to that point in her life or somebody did it because they were dating somebody or somebody did it because their friends were doing it as well like that's the reason why they came to it and they ended up believing it themselves another reason people may believe on Jesus Christ or come to the point of believing on Jesus is that they got a good feeling they maybe they went to church and they're like oh man, I just I just felt good when I was there and that's why they ended up believing on Jesus Christ another reason is uh, people may have just fallen on hard times you know, they went to church, people were loving, people were helpful, and that's what made them, because they're a Christian, why? Because then they, they just went to church and that's where they got some help. If they had went somewhere else and got some help, maybe they were something else. Uh, they were just lucky they went to the right place and got saved. <clears throat> what about another reason why people come to believe on Jesus Christ? Maybe it's just a fear, a fear of hell. Some people just believe on Jesus Christ because they're just scared they're going to go to hell. So that's what compels them to believe on Jesus and that's the extent of their reasoning. And the last one I've got here is maybe a hope of reward, a hope of gain and maybe not a spiritual gain. But some people, you know, maybe, maybe you, you've never thought of this before, but some people become Christians because they're hoping that that'll bless their business, that'll prosper them financially that'll prosper them in their health or something they're hoping for something back in this life and they end up believing on jesus christ now <coughs> these reasons don't necessarily invalidate your faith in christ because different people get to that door of jesus christ different ways but as long as they walk through that door they put their faith on jesus christ they will be saved right but if you don't grow from that point, see, if that's the reason why you, you got to salvation, and that's where you stay, if you don't grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, one day you may end up walking away from God. You may end up walking away from the faith. Yeah, if you're, if you're saved, you'll never lose your salvation, right? Because people that get truly saved, once they're saved, they're always saved. But that doesn't mean you're going to stay in the faith you're going to keep walking in the religion of christianity and actually use your life to serve god if you don't grow in grace and in knowledge according to second peter 3. grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory both now and forever amen look at what colossians 2 says and this i say lest any man should beguile you with enticing words so you see how the way people get taken away from the religion the way people get taken away from the truth is they're conned into it they're deceived and or they start thinking they start taking on ideas that are not true because they're not solidified in their own beliefs for though i be absent in the flesh yet am i with you in the spirit drawing and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in christ as you have therefore received christ jesus the lord now by faith so walk ye in him so you see how we are saved by faith and we also walk by faith <coughs> rooted and built up in him look and established in the faith as you have been taught so you see how you get established in the faith you need to learn some things to get established in that faith 
abounding therein with thanksgiving. So if you don't grow in the faith, if you don't grow in your knowledge, you're going to be a little bit shaky on you know, your beliefs and your steadfastness in your faith. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. So philosophy is our ways of thinking, right? That's how we get spoiled, is if we get tripped up in different ways of thinking and we end up doubting the truth. And vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So different people come to salvation through different ways. But you need to grow beyond a bad reason to a point where you actually know what you believe and you know what you're talking about so you have some solidity in your faith. You're not carried away with you know, these enticing words and this vain for, uh, deceit through philosophy. Now when I think about how I got saved a long time ago, I, I started out as an agnostic really because my parents were not really religious. I mean, my mom kind of followed, you know, the feng shui stuff, you know, because she's, she's Chinese, right? So she's, you know, she's Chinese, she's got the feng shui. And I remember growing up, my mom would always go to the bookshop looking at the latest astrology books, right? Uh, reading astrology, your horoscope. So I knew what my, always knew what my horoscope was. And she, she was very superstitious in that sense, but not really religious. She never really, you know, uh, made us believe anything, but she definitely believed these things. My dad didn't have any beliefs, didn't really push us into any religion. He just had really strong cultural pride, you know, my dad. So he's like, you know, you know thinks we should do Chinese things. He's all for Chinese New Year. You know, he just got upset at me recently because I, I didn't know it was a mid-autumn festival that's <laughs> going on. So I'm like, whoops, it's not something I celebrate. So, you know, that's what my dad is. He, you know, he, I guess he wishes I was more Chinese than I am. Well, you know, he gave birth to kids in Australia. So, um, so I, I think I was, raised, I was raised agnostic, just not really caring too much, ignorant about religion. It wasn't until really I learned about the theory of evolution in high school is when I really took on the belief of atheism. And my earliest memory, well, the earliest memory I have really about atheism is in my year 10 science class, I had a teacher who was quite charismatic and quite funny, and he was an atheist. And he was the one really that sticks out in my mind when I was younger that made atheism sound the most reasonable uh, when he would explain it. But I, I specifically remember thinking though, as an atheist, that life was just so meaningless. Because as you go through life, if you're an, oh, this is my experience anyway, when you're an atheist and you believe, like my year 10 science teacher used to explain, that life was just about reproduction and really had no meaning, and he compared us to a flower, and he said, like, just like a flower has the stem and the petals, and it's all there to, like, attract bees so it can reproduce. It's like, that's why you have legs, and that's why you eat. It's just, you're just there just trying to reproduce. That's the purpose of your life, just as purposeful as the flower, right? So I remember thinking in my life, man, life is just so meaningless. And uh, even going through uni, thinking, man, like, what's the point of all this? What's the point of striving for excellence? Because, yeah, you strive for excellence, it's just about living it up, right? It's just about enjoying life. And I definitely remember living life that way because I believe that, hey, we're just here for a short time, nothing mattered eternally. You know, even if you did something for the next generation, I mean, they're going to die and cease to exist. So what was the point? What was the end goal if nothing mattered eternally? So you may as well just live life and enjoy life as much as possible. So I remember that's how I lived until Christianity entered my world. And uh, when it did, and I won't go into the full story, eventually I was convinced that Christianity was true. Um, and I remember when I started talking about the things of God, even as an atheist, there was something in me that always thought, you know, there had to be more to life than just life itself. You know, and I think we just have that natural inkling, but that's just, that was just my experience, where even though as an atheist and uh, uh, reasonably at the time, I thought atheism and that there was no God was reasonable, but inside me it was always like, surely there's more to life than just this life. Surely, like, I'm just not here, I live and then I die. And that is it. So eventually I was convinced, and that's what I'm talking about today, the reasons that sort of convinced me. 
But I'll admit that when I believed on Jesus Christ, I didn't know everything that I know today. I mean, I've, I've obviously learnt a lot over the years and you know, honed my positions and my arguments and things like that over the years. And while I understood the gospel message <coughs> very well at the beginning when I got saved, I understood that salvation was by grace and that I just had to believe on Jesus Christ. You know, there was always a part of me that thought, well, how do I know Christianity is the right religion? Out of all the hundreds, yay, thousands that are out there. That's what people tell you, right? There's all these hundreds of religions out there. There's all these thousands of different beliefs. How do you know that yours is the right one? You know, have you, have you checked them all out? You know, what if there's something that you don't know that, that is true? You know, I'm sure that's crossed your mind before. That's crossed my mind. That crossed my mind before. But as I've come to realize, I don't really have these thoughts anymore because what I've come to realize, and this is what I want to share with you this morning and what I want to talk through, is there really isn't that many philosophies in life. You know, you think, you know, you're told like there are at least thousands or hundreds of different religions. I doubt anyone who says that could even name more than 10. You know, could even name them, right? Because it's just this, this, just this idea that there's all these different religions out there. And what you find is that there are only a few main philosophies and all these hundreds and thousands that they're talking about, if they even know what they are, are just variations on these main philosophies. So if you can look at them in their category, right, and group them together, you can analyze a whole hundred, like it's like Christianity, right? If you think about Christianity, when people are talking about these hundreds of different religions they're including like lutheran methodist you know and what are those catholicism you know you can even throw like jehovah's witness and mormon in there they're all all trains of thought based on the bible so you can kind of analyze them in one go and think okay well these these, these we can group into one group and these we can group into another group and there really isn't that many to go through in fact there are four groups that i've identified that really can encompass any line of thinking so what's the first one? The first one is relativism. Now what is relativism? If you look this up on Google, this is how it's defined, and I would agree with this definition. It says the doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, and historical context and are not absolute. So what relativism is, it means there is no absolute truth. You might have heard uh, somebody like Oprah Winfrey say something like, that's your truth, that's my truth. This is this relativistic idea that nothing is absolutely true, it's only true because um, you know, culture accepts it or society is accepting it or historical context. That's how the Muslims sort of, you know, they, they, they justify uh, pedophilia, right? Sleeping with children before they've even had their period because they say, well, in that historical context, that was, that was allowed, whereas now it's not allowed, whereas the Bible says that it's never allowed. So it's this, there's this idea that there is no absolute truth. Now religions, if you think of most New Age religions, that's what they fall under. So when you think of those, all these different hundreds and thousands of ideas of thought, and, but when you think about Hinduism, Buddhism, all these New Age religions that are coming out, all these New Age philosophy, you, know, you come across this person, You've never heard the religion before, but it's based on some guru in some third world country that's, you know, swallowed some, you know, like in, in Malaysia, like they swallow something and then they regurgitate it and then it's like, and then they sell you this gem. To, <laughs> you guys are, like, and my dad is always so, that's why he was so glad that like my stepmom you know, got saved and became a Christian because he hated those guys. He knew those guys were like con men, right? So there's all that stuff that's out there. Astrology you can put into this same bundle as well. It's just this idea that, you know, it's just true for you, true for me. There's no absolute truth. Yeah, if you believe that, that's your belief. If I believe, that's fine. We can, this whole all roads uh, lead to Rome idea. Now, this idea is actually in the Bible from Pilate. So when Jesus and Pilate have that confrontation together and, Je and Pilate is questioning Jesus, he actually alludes to this idea of relativism. It says, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? So he, see how he's asking Jesus these questions. Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself? Or did others tell it thee of me? 
Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? <coughs> Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not, of this, not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So you see how Jesus said, I came into the world to testify of truth. And then look at what Pilate says to him. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? So you see how Pilate had this idea that there was no absolute truth. And Jesus, he's, Jesus is telling him, Hey, I've come in to testify of the truth. And Pilate says, Well, what is truth? It's, that's why it's just a relativistic idea that there is no such thing really as truth because truth is just what you determine it to be. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But what does the Bible say? See, this idea of relativism doesn't jive logically, right? Because when you have religions, because there's not just religions like Hinduism and Buddhism in the world, you have religions that make exclusive statements. And Jesus, in relation to truth, makes exclusive statements. Like this one in John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So you see how this is a statement by Jesus in the Bible saying there is one way to heaven and that way is through Jesus Christ. Now, if somebody takes the view that all religions are the same, all religions are just a different take on things, then you have to somehow in your mind accept contradictory positions. If you have one religion that says, this is the way to heaven, and you have another religion that says, well, there's all ways that lead to heaven, they can't both be right. And that's why, to me, this idea of relativism or just relative truth is not logical. It's not, irrational. It's not rational. And that's why logic destroys the religions that are in this group because all religions cannot be valid when some religions are exclusive. And even, you know, within yourself, you kind of think, well, what about morality? Is morality just a social construct? Even people that take positions like relativism make absolute statements because they'll say that, you ask them, well, is murder always wrong? And they say, yeah. Well, it's like, well, if everyone thought murder was okay, is that okay? They're like, no, it's never okay. So then you can see that sometimes even people that hold to relativistic views don't actually believe it themselves because they do believe in absolute truths. And even if somebody says there's no such thing as absolute truth, that in and of itself is an absolute statement. So it's hard to even take the view that there is no absolute truth when you have to make a statement of absolute truth in order to take that position. So a lot of the different wacky religions out there, like when you think of the hippies, when you think of the people that are just sort of really off the edge, fall into this category of relativism, like there's no truth out there. Um, so we can sort of write those ones off in one big go because they are not rational, right? We, we don't leave our brain at the door in order to believe something and if you believe something and can't think about it intellectually, then it's probably the wrong religion. What well, it is the wrong religion, because there's only one right religion. Okay, so that's one group. A second group is atheism. Now, what is atheism? See, this, it's interesting when you look up the atheism in the dictionary, that they've tried to, I believe they've tried to redefine it, right? Disbelief or a lack of belief in the existence of God. So you see similar is non-belief, non-theism, disbelief, unbelief, skepticism and doubt. So you see how they've, they've tried to redefine atheism as agnosticism. Because you'll see later when we look at agnosticism, you'll see that the similarities are the same. The fact that you're just doubting, you don't believe anything, you're a skeptic. But that's not what atheism is. Atheism is a belief because when you don't believe in the existence of God, that is a belief, to believe that there is no God. Because you can't prove that. See, an agnostic is truly somebody that just says, oh, I don't know, I don't really think about it. They're ignorant. Whereas athe an atheist is not. So the fact that they've tried to, you know, now align those together, I think is a little deceptive. 
But if somebody calls themselves an atheist but they're actually an agnostic, that's fun. I find that a lot when you go out and preach the gospel and you talk to people. A lot of people that initially claim to be atheists, when you talk to them a bit more, they actually start admitting, well, you know, I just don't really know what else is out there. So they're actually an agnostic. They're not actually an atheist. They're not actually somebody that believes that there is no God and then believes in naturalistic explanations of the world. <coughs> so atheism is the grouping where somebody believes that there is no God at all. Now what does Romans 1 say? Romans 1 says when you look at the creation of the world, that it's clearly seen that there is a God for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, you know, what really changed my mind, you know, because like I was telling you how I got saved, I went from being an agnostic to sort of an atheist. And what changed my mind about atheism is it didn't make sense. And I'll explain to you some of the reasons why it, they just, it just is not rational. Because when you talk to an atheist, their big claim is that everything they believe is based on science. You know, the theory of evolution is based on science. But when you look at the definition of science, look what it says. It says the intellectual practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world, look at this, through observation and experiment. And what I realized with the theory of evolution, what I mean by the theory of evolution is this whole idea that nothing created something. You know, we're not talking about natural selection. We're not talking about the fact that you look around this room, we have different color hair, and different colored eyes, some of us are taller and shorter. That, that, that's a scientific fact. The fact that, you know, as people breed, natural selection happens and changes happen and people look different. Nobody's denying that. When we talk about the theory of evolution, we're talking about nothing existing in the beginning and then a big bang happening and then, you know, over millions and millions of years you have little changes until we see that now. Is that science? Well, was that observed? Were, we, were they there to watch the Big Bang and they're watching the millions of years? One animal change into another? Were they able to experiment with it? Were they able to test that and actually you know, demonstrate that in a laboratory? No, they haven't been able to. So don't get this idea that atheism is somehow scientific. No, it's a religion just like every other religion. You know, we don't claim as well. You know, we don't claim that Christianity is science. Right? Because science is things you can observe and repeat. There are things about Christianity that are not scientific. The existence of the soul, the existence of God, the things you can't see and test and repeat. Morality is not scientific. Right? So what is science? Science is the things that you can observe and the religion is how you interpret the science that you do observe. So you do science, you see something, and your religion says, well, that's interesting how God designed it that way, how God made it that way. Whereas the atheist has to think, well, it's so interesting how it just came about by natural chance selection. And then that's where they start to really go off the deep end in my, in, 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 from my position. So there's three examples I just want to share with you that, that really sort of like sealed the deal for me on why I believe atheism is completely irrational and why, you know, I really like talking to atheists that believe their belief is rational and seeing how they try and explain these facts. But one is, if they believe that atheism is scientific, when have they ever observed it? You know, so I always ask the question, well, what belief, creation or evolution, is actually based, actually has a rationale in scientific basis, in, 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 in science? Because what do we actually observe in the world? What we actually observe in the world, where life comes from, it always comes from pre-existing life. So what the atheist will say is, who knows what started here? But what happens is somehow something started, life started, never mind how the universe started. The universe was always there. Somehow the universe started, then the first living cell started, and from that you get all the different types of animals. Now what a creationist would say is they would say, no, no, God created the original kinds of animals, and then you have natural selection. So you have the diversity 
in the different animals and yeah down the line maybe these can no longer interbreed but the original kinds would have been able to interbreed and you have more of a instead of an evolutionary tree they call it the creation orchid right where you have different uh, kinds of animals that God created and then they diversify from there so if our belief is that God who is life created the original life and then life comes from life but the Darwinian belief or the evolutionary belief is there was no life in the beginning and life just sprung spontaneously from nowhere and then that's where you get life from. Well, whose view has a rationale in science? You know, like they're trying to say to us that we're crazy believing in a God, believing in Christianity, believing Jesus. But, you know, at least what we believe is based on something we actually see. See, what I believe is life comes from life. When I look at the world, life comes from life. That's what I see. But when I look at the world, I never see non-life, life coming from non-life. And yet, atheism is a more rational belief. See, that's, see, that's, that's what I, 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 I fail to see, like how they see it that way. Like, you know, how do they see that their view is more scientific? Unless, you know, um, you know I've talked to a lot of evolutionists and, you know, this is what I always try and explain to them. I always try and explain, well, wait a second, what I believe is actually based on science, but what you believe is not based on science. So how am I less scientific than you? Uh, I just had this picture from a previous sermon, how we always see life coming from life, you know, and we always see animals giving birth to the same animal. You might have heard of the Miller experiment, because that's really like the main one that atheists go to, to try and prove, oh, no, no, but if we have the right conditions... Right? then we can create life from non-life. And you might have heard of the Miller experiment where they tried to mix you know, hydrogen and nitrogen into this thing and then they put a spark into it and they created some proteins and they say, ah, look, see, this is how life might have started. But see, when you have to do this, this just proves the creationist point because some intelligent being had to put this apparatus together. And even when they put it together, they only created like left-hand proteins and you need left-hand and right-hand proteins. So... You didn't even create life. You just created some proteins that, you know, that didn't even go from there. So that's one thing. Life always creates more life. Number two is, and this is really like a, a more complex version of the design means as a designer argument. What does that mean? That means when I look at something that is designed like this building, logic dictates that there must have been somebody to build this building. But you see, the evolutionists will say, oh no, well, you know, evolution just gives you the appearance of design because things evolve to naturally adapt to what it is. So it looks like it's designed to do that job, it's just really evolved to do that job. But where I think that argument falls over is in the argument of information. You see, because you might say, well, a car has a builder, a building has a builder, and they might reason their way around, or, you know, it just looks like it's designed to drive and has all the parts because that's how it's evolved. But when you get to the argument of information, this is where they have no explanation for the origin of information. Now, what is information? Information is when you actually have a language system and then somebody has to put that information into something and then you have to understand the language system to get that information. And the reason why it's such a strong argument for creation is because matter can never just produce information. See, a non-thinking being, matter that just has no intelligence at all, cannot communicate a message, right? Nature just creates patterns and just does things that are, you know, have no... Um, intelligence or information behind it but once you have a message there once you have information that needs to be interpreted an intelligent being needs to put that there and that's what we always see so one example you always see from the evolutionist point of view is this idea of putting all these letters into a hat so this is how i sort of explain this this idea of information and why it just doesn't come from nothing so one, one example they'll give you when you're learning evolution is, well, I'm just going to put all these letters into a hat, and if we randomly select a letter out of a hat, if I pass this hat around and we all select a letter, eventually we might pull out a letter C, and we might pull out a letter A, and we might pull out a letter T. And what does that spell? You say, ah, look, it spells the, letter, spells the word cat. 
And if we do it long enough, eventually we might get a whole sentence. And even, you know, even though the possibility is so minute, if we had a long enough time, we might even get you know, the whole Bible you know, written out. But think about this question, right? Why does, why does the letters C-A-T even mean anything to you? Well, they mean something to you because you know the English language. But what if you didn't speak English? Would cat mean anything to you? It just means gibberish. Well, what about the letters C-A-T? Where did they come from? Why does ink in that particular form actually mean something? Or A in that particular form actually mean, what means something because somebody first had to establish the English language in order to communicate a message and write down information. So, like the English language, our DNA is a language as well. And that's what they've realized. They've realized that there's, there's this information that is so minute on every cell of your body that this information is there. Who put it there? Who determined the language that is read from your DNA in order to build different things? Blue eyes, why is it like that? Well, it's because an intelligent being put it there. Now, the last argument I'll just touch on is this idea of irreducible complexity. And the idea is, the analogy that's used is a mousetrap. So this idea that things evolve slowly over time doesn't make sense when you have systems that are irreducibly complex. I mean, what does that mean? When you reduce them to their basic form, they have different parts that must all be there for that organism to function. So just like a mousetrap, a mousetrap is down to its most basic form. All the parts have a purpose. They all need to be there in order for a mouse to get caught by this mousetrap. If you take away any of the parts, that mousetrap no longer functions like a mousetrap. Now think of all the complex systems of the human body. You have the respiratory system, the lymphatic system, the, the blood system, the nervous system, you know, the digestive system. All these systems in your body work because all the parts need to be there. Now you know if something is missing in these, these systems, you no longer function well, right? So how do these systems evolve when they all need to be there in order to work? Like what, what evolved first? Did your stomach lining, the fat lining in your stomach evolve first? Or the acid that's in your stomach, that, that the, the fat lining needs to be there so that this, this, this acid doesn't just burn through your stomach and just like melt a hole in your body. So the stomach, the acid in your body is actually very, very acidic, hydrochloric acid. But the reason why it doesn't just burn through your stomach is because there's a fat lining to keep it in there. So which one evolved first? You know? So there are questions like this. These are the things that started to make me think, man, evolution just doesn't make sense when I start to think of it. Like what started it all? How did it evolve from one thing to the next? How did birds evolve from land animals when they have like different bone structures? Feathers are completely different. You know, what about symbiotic relationships that exist? And then you just make, it makes you think that, well, if, if we have technology and, and, and it would be so crazy and irrational to think that a computer with the technology and the chips that are in it just evolved from nothing, why would something that is hundreds of times more complex and minute than a computer evolve from nothing? So you see how it's just like it's completely irrational. So that's why you can, you can, you can discount relativism and you can say, Atheism. It's, I've never, I, I, there's, there's nothing that would convince me of atheism because to convince me of atheism would to convince me that nobody created a computer, right? But if something created a computer and there's something way more complex, because our body is an electrical system as well, you know? Like our body has like electrics going through it and you know, when you start getting into that sort of stuff, it's quite amazing like how the body works. But you know, our body is a machine that is designed by God. That's why the Bible truly says, you know, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. All right, let's continue. Now, the third category. So we've done relativism, one category. We can lump in all the Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age, astrology views, hippie views. Then you have atheism. There is no God. I hope you can see now that that's not uh, rational. <clears throat> the third one is all the religions that are based on the Bible. So when you think about religions like Judaism, 
Christianity and all the variations there. Uh, Islam as well. Islam is like, you know, like I would group into the same category as like Mormonism. Because that's all Islam is. Islam is just like the, you know, the, the, the Eastern, you know, the, the Middle Eastern version of Mormonism, right? Where, you know, you got the angel coming to a prophet and then getting their new book. Well, that's what happened with Mormonism. You got the angel Moroni coming to their prophet, Joseph Smith. And then, you know, that's, that's spent, but, but they always based off Christianity. Right? So it's, it's not like any of these religions are just an entirely new religion, entirely new history, you know, the, all the cults that are out there, all the different denominations, if you think about it. Even Judaism. Judaism is supposedly meant to be the Old Testament. Right? So the Old Testament's still there. It's not like it's disappeared. So Christianity was meant to be based on that, right? Based on the beliefs there with something's changed, Jesus coming. But the Jews nowadays don't even follow the Old Testament. Right? Because look at what Jesus says. He says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom he trusts. For had ye believed Moses, look at what Jesus says, he would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So when you think about all the religions that are based on the Bible, or have some sort of biblical history, we have the source to be able to test them. So why do we come to the position we do in Christianity? Because why don't we just go to the Bible itself and see what the Bible actually says? Because all these other religions are based off it, right? Jehovah's Witnesses are based, meant to be based off the Bible. Catholicism is meant to be based off the Bible. Orthodoxy is meant to be based on the Bible. Ju Judaism, the Bible is the, uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, right? So that's why we still have the Old Testament, the New Testament. Even Islam says that it's meant to be based you know, off biblical history. So when we go to the biblical history and we look at the Bible, we look at the New Testament, we can see what it actually says and that's when we can start chopping off all these different thoughts and different philosophies within Christianity and come down to the belief that we have today. And that's, we're not talking about that one. So that one, you know, obviously this is the category that we sit in and we're not really talking about all the differences between the different... Uh, denominations today but this is how you can know you can sit in this category with the bible because if one deviates from the bible then you can rule that out now what's the last category so we've got relativism atheism we've got religions that are based in biblical history so we can go to the bible to get the truth of that <coughs> the last one is agnosticism Agnosticism. Now, I don't think you can think of a position that's really outside of these four groups. So this really encompasses all of them. Now, remember when we went to the definition of atheism, look at how similar agnosticism is. Look, a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence or nature of God. But look at the similar words. Skeptic, doubter, questioner, doubting Thomas, a challenger. So you see how they're trying to make atheism and agnosticism mean the same thing now. Whereas if you're an atheist, you're actually an agnostic as opposed to actually believing there is no God. It's just that you're just a skeptic. You're just a doubter. But you know what? It, it, it requires no, not as much thought just to like poke holes in somebody's theory if you have no alternative. Do you know what I mean? So people who just, oh, I'm just a skeptic. They, you know, you cannot convince a skeptic of anything because they'll always find a reason not to believe it. But then ask them for an alternative solution and see what they say. Yeah. Right? So this is why when I talk to like a, you know, atheists who just, just want to rip down every argument, well, start putting them on the defense and you'll start to realize how, un, how, how irrational their beliefs are. Yeah, they, they'll say, oh, how do you believe it? How do you explain this? How do you explain this one? Well, get them to explain how life came from non-life. Get them to explain where morality comes from. Get them to explain why, you know, why the body is so complex if there's no creator, all these things. They can't explain these things. So at least we have an explanation for the things we know. You know, yeah, there, uh, uh, does that mean we know everything? We know all the, all the facts about the universe and everything? Nobody's claiming to have full knowledge, but at least we have a belief that is coherent, that is logical, that it can explain the things that we see, as opposed to just being a skeptic, just saying, well, I'm not just going to believe anything. 
But see, the problem with agnosticism, so agnosticism is somebody that just says, we just, we just don't, we can't know. We don't know what is true. But see, the problem with this position is the existence of Jesus Christ. See, because once you know the facts surrounding Jesus Christ's life, it's, that's why the Bible says people are willingly ignorant. Right? Because you're not ignorant because the knowledge is not out there. Because if you went and sought the truth, you would find the truth. But the people that stay in agnosticism, the Bible says it's because they're willingly ignorant. They want to be ignorant. Right? Second Peter 3, look, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. See, those people just make fun of things. So it's easy to make fun of something, but it's hard to actually defend a view and give an explanation for how things actually came to be walking after their own lusts and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of god the heavens were of old so this is creation and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished I just think it's interesting that they're ignorant of creation, the fact that there's an intelligent being beside, behind the creation of the world, but they're also ignorant, willingly ignorant of the flood. And why I find that interesting is the fact that, you know, when people say, well, how can there be a global flood? And then you think, well, wait a second, 70% of the world is covered in water, right? And, they, and, you know, Ken Hovind does something interesting where he says, well, if you were to just, like, increase, you know, the level of water, by a certain amount, like the, the, the amount of uh, earth that is above the water decreases significantly. But not only that, you know, they see like, you know, I don't know if you've uh, looked into the flood arguments, but you know, how like every like religion, a lot of like, mostly every religion has some flood legend, you know, that's, that's, that's uh, equivalent to the Noah's flood um, story in the Bible. You see, you know, water, uh, erosion on mountains and on uh, on ranges and things like that and then they find like sea creatures that live like on the bottom of the ocean their fossils are like in mountaintops you know you see like fossils of trees that are just like stripped bare going through like layers of rock I mean how how do these things come about so there's so much evidence out there that is explained very well by a global flood but you know people don't want to accept that they're willingly ignorant of these facts but what about Jesus? What about some things about Jesus? And I've preached on these things before, but these are the things that really got me thinking and really convinced me. <clears throat> Number one is, when you read through the New Testament Gospels, you're not reading through a fairy tale. See, to me, the Bible was always a fairy tale of stories. But look at how Luke 3 starts. It says here, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, look at all these names that are being given and Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. So this is the start of the story of John the Baptist. Now this is not how, this is not how you start a story if you want to tell a fairy tale. If you want to dupe people into a false history, you don't start it by giving them timestamps and saying, well, when this, you know, when Scott Morrison was the prime minister and Donald Trump was the president, you're giving all these figures at a certain time and saying, that's when John the Baptist came. Because now somebody can check. You know, somebody can see when they're reading this, when Paul, or when Luke has written it, they can check. Well, did this, were these people really around? You know, and we know that Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea because he was the one that spoke with Jesus. So you see how these things people can check at the time this was written so this would not go any further if it was false right if it was false and the people that were alive because they could falsify it um, so that's one that it's a historical account but not only that when we look in acts 26 i'll just skip through for the sake of time but when paul is pleading with festus to believe the gospel look at what he says here he says in verse 26 for the king knoweth of these things before whom also i speak freely for i am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him for this thing was not done in a corner so you see the the story of jesus was not some private secret revelation that was done where nobody was it was done public 
And that's why not only is it written about in the Gospels, where you see John testifying of himself witnessing the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he says here, Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. So there's all these facts about Jesus. You know, it's a historical, it's a historical recollection. Not only do we have the apostles testifying of Jesus' life, but also the fact that he died. But not only do we have Christian sources, we also have secular sources as well. We have Josephus saying here, Josephus was a Jewish historian. Look what he says. Hence to suppress the rumour, he falsely charged with guilt and punished Christians who were hated for their, for, hated for their enormities. Christus, right? So he recognised that there was a man by the name of Jesus Christ, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate. So you see how it's not only Luke that is saying John the Baptist came at the time of Pontius Pilate, Jesus talking with Pontius Pilate. Josephus is saying, hey, Pontius Pilate put Jesus Christ to death. Procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. Doesn't that sound familiar? Where did that come from? Remember in Luke 3? Tiberius Caesar. So you see how it's not just Christian sources that are saying this. It is non-believing Jewish sources as well. And even when you look at Roman sources and Tacitus, he says, at this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. And his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive see isn't that interesting that even a roman historian knew hey christians at the time were saying that jesus rose from the dead so it wasn't just the gospels that got corrupted like the muslims try and say and it's something that came later no even tacitus in 56 120 a.d writing no christians at the time were preaching that he rose from the dead that he was alive accordingly he was perhaps the messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. So one, we know that Jesus died. We know as well that the tomb was empty. Why? Because the Jews made up stories to try and explain that the tomb was empty. Look in Matthew 28. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. <coughs> now, if Jesus died and he was just a man, and he was buried, and he didn't rise again, what happened to the body? Remember they rolled the tomb, the stone across the tomb, and they put a guard on that tomb. Now if the disciples went out saying, well, he's risen from the dead, what could they do? They'd just go get the body and say, look, no, he's still dead. His body's still there. But the fact that they had to make up a story to try and explain why the body was missing, that just shows that when the tomb was open, the tomb was empty. The body was nowhere to be found. So we know that Jesus died. He died publicly. His body was missing. And then you have the testimony of the early disciples that he rose again from the dead. A, a testimony that they were willing to die for. For I delivered unto you, this is 1 Corinthians 15, first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter the apostle, then of the twelve, and that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, and look at this, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. 
Now, if you were making up a story about Jesus rising from the dead, would you say, hey, he was seen of above 500 people, and you know what? Most of these people are still alive today. So you couldn't make a claim like that while people are still alive. Because why? People can go check and go ask, did this really happen? Is this what you saw? You know, 500 people. But not only that, when we read on. After that, he was seen of James. James was a brother of Jesus that was not a believer in Jesus while Jesus walked the earth. Then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. This is Paul talking about himself now. For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. See, if this story of Jesus rising from the dead was just a myth, why would people that were against that, why would they become followers? You had Paul, one of the most zealous persecutors of the church of God, converting and now preaching that he saw Jesus Christ. I mean, what would talk somebody who was against the cause of Jesus Christ to now preach that he saw Jesus Christ unless he actually saw him? So that's why there are these facts about Jesus' death, the fact that the tomb was empty, the fact that people saw, they were willing to die preaching that they saw Jesus, not just people that were for his message, but people that were contrary to his message. What is the explanation for these facts? If not, truly Jesus did rise again from the dead. Now, what's the conclusion of all this? We have four scenarios, right? So I hope in your mind, what, what's the question I'm trying to answer today? Why am I a Christian? Because this is how I think of it. I used to have this thought, what if I believed the wrong thing? You know, what if there's something else out there? But now I realize there is nothing else out there. Because when you look at all the different categories of beliefs out there, you can start to just chop them out one by one. Relativism, right? And probably my mom had the most <laughs> to sort of uh, destroy my belief in, in New Age relativism because of the book she was reading. I just thought, this is the astrology I always knew was a con. Right? Just, you know, just believing things, people writing things that are just so generic that I just can apply to anybody, right? So it was really like logic that destroyed my belief in New Age relativism. And then when you think about the evolution of creation, when I then became an atheist, it was the defense of creationism that destroyed my faith in atheism. And then at that time, when I went back to being an agnostic, thinking, well, what is true then if evolution is not true? It was the, the defense of the resurrection that made me a believer on Jesus Christ and realizing that this man actually existed. This man actually was a historical figure that existed, that died, he was buried, his body was missing, and then you have this surge of people going out and preaching the gospel. What's the explanation for that? See, the Muslims as well, they don't have an explanation for this. They just believe Jesus died, he was replaced, but then they can't explain, well, why, then why does Christianity exist? Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Christianity would have no reason to exist. Right? Because the early disciples wouldn't have gone out preaching that Jesus had rose from the dead. So it was the facts about Jesus Christ that destroyed any chance of me taking a position of agnosticism. Now why did I, believe, why did I go to John 6 to begin with when we did the Bible reading? Let's go there now. Because I think this passage here in, at the end of John 6 is very relevant to, I believe, you know, how we can defend and how we come to the position of Christianity. In John 6, if you remember in, in the passage of John 6, Jesus was saying some pretty hard things. He was talking about eating his flesh, drinking his blood. And many of the disciples didn't understand what he was going on about. It didn't make sense to them. And a lot of people ended up leaving the faith because of that. Many, therefore, his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What does that mean? Does it sort of shake you? Does it, does it upset you? What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. 
It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So you see, if you stick around long enough, eventually you'll learn the answers. But some people, they get, they get upset, they get offended, they get out of the faith because things don't make sense to them. Yeah, well maybe you just didn't stick around long enough to find out the answer, right? And find out how it makes sense. Sometimes it takes time to grow in grace and in your knowledge. So these guys, they didn't just leave when Jesus said that. They stuck around and then Jesus revealed to them what it actually meant. No, he didn't mean actually eat flesh physically. It's a spirit, there's a spiritual meaning behind it. You need to partake spiritually of his flesh and blood. That's how you partake of the bread of life and you have life in you. You will not die, you have eternal life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So even if people get the explanation, there are still people that don't believe. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So you see, God gives us that understanding. Otherwise, people, sometimes they, they forsake Jesus and walk no more with him. Now, this is what I think about when I think of why I'm a Christian. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? What is he saying? He's saying, if you have doubts, are you going to leave as well? But look at what, how Peter answers him. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. What is Peter saying here? Well, if I leave Jesus... What's my alternative? So you see how like, like the atheists and the agnostics, yeah, they can try and poke holes in Christianity. And yeah, do we have all the answers? Can we prove 100% Christianity is true? No, we can't prove 100% that Christianity is true. We may not have all the answers to all the hard questions, but if you leave Jesus, where are you going to go? Are you going to go to atheism? They have no explanation for how life even began, no purpose, that doesn't even line up with what we view, what we see in the world. Are you going to go to agnosticism, denying all the facts around Jesus? Are you going to go to relativism? Are you going to start believing anything can be true and just be totally irrational? So that's why I don't have a problem. I have no doubt that I'm in the right camp. Right Now it's just about what are the right beliefs within that camp. And we have the truth. We have the Bible where we can figure those things out. And that's why I am where I am. Right now, I'm just trying to figure out, hey, how do I explain these things? What are the right answers? Because I know I'm in the right camp, but I may not have all the answers. And this is what I think about when I think about why I'm a Christian. I think about Simon Peter. Well, if he was to leave Jesus, where would, what would I believe then? What, what would I believe? Because I, I have to believe something. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. So again, you may not be able to prove everything. You know, we don't, we're not, we don't believe in Christianity because we can prove it 100% scientifically. And if you believe you can, you're wrong because you can't prove it scientifically. But is it the most rational belief out of the different positions that are out there? Absolutely. And you, I, hopefully this sermon helps you get your head around that. Because I've always had that thought of, you know, what if I'm wrong? What if this is something I don't know? You know, obviously you can't know everything. But of all the things that are out there, guaranteed, you can put them into one of those four categories. And as you work through and analyze each of those categories, you can see that you can just start knocking them off one at a time until you realize, hey, we get back to the Bible. And, you know, I came to this position over a period of time thinking of it. But it was interesting because I was watching something from Cross Examined. That's Frank Turek's ministry, and his is a, an apologetic ministry. And I was just watching one video once, and then uh, one of his trainee speakers that got up actually used this exact same point. And I was, I was just a little bit shocked because I was like, oh man, I'm not the only one, obviously, that's had this thought. You know? So he got up and he was, he was saying basically what I was saying. He was saying, you know what, a lot of people think that there's all these different beliefs out there, but if you, and he sort of categorized them slightly differently, but he basically had his categories and said, well, when you categorize them this way, then you can remove all doubt and know that you're in the right camp. And really the question is, if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what then will you believe? 
So that's why I think we can be sure that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you for the assurance that we have. Lord, we know that we have to have faith. We're not going to have scientific proof of Christianity. But Lord, I'm so thankful that we have a faith that is intellectual, a faith that is based on what we observe in the world, and a faith that is based in true history, facts that are there, Lord, not something that is made up. Um, so I just thank you, Lord, that you've provided us with your word. That Lord, we can have assurance that we're in the right camp. We know we have the truth. Now it's just a matter of understanding it. So I just pray, Lord, that you'd help us because we need to grow, not only in grace, but also in knowledge, so that, Lord, we can get to the point where we can be bold in our faith and we can share it with others so others may know you as well as their Saviour. We thank you and praise you in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.